So um, I'm Nigel, I uh, work for a company called Encore, um, we're based in Bristol here. Um, I thought I'd give this talk, this talk's probably more of a sort of soft talk rather than a technical talk, but as, uh, as Lee was saying, quite a lot of us have to live with legacy code. And it is, yes, this, this is, this is your supporting me. Um, so starting off with, you know, what is legacy? And I think probably um, talking amongst ourselves, quite often we know kind of what legacy sort of means. Um, and indeed, yes. And there's probably a list of, um, list of systems that we use. I mean, and being a PHP, we'd probably start off, okay, so WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, go through a list of things. I'd probably add in maybe at one stage I did do some stuff on Zencart, which, um, yes, this is why I've sort of slightly lighter hair now. Um, there is a different side to legacy, though, because um, you know, when we had the, the Olympics, we were celebrating the fact that the UK had the legacy of a, a free point of service health system. Um, so, at some stage, we need to be aware of what that old code is, why it was there. Um, so, as I said, you know, so if we went through those suspects of WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, then, I mean, let's face it, they were written sort of over 15 years ago. They were started off by a sort of group of the community getting in, getting stuck in and having to deliver something rather than being able to sit back and think, let me architect this in the right way. They didn't even have that experience of what was the right way for the internet at that stage. If you think um, all those came in probably, well, certainly less than 10 years after the, the internet was open for commercial traffic. So what the hell did you do? You know, I say Zencart, that gave me some nightmares, but you know, until mid nineties, nobody was running an e-commerce site. So somebody come up, it's open source, it's there, it's available, it was there, it did its job. Um, the fact that I'm glad that I'm not using it anymore is, is a different matter. So there are good things about legacy. And um, I think it's important to be able to, to, to make that distinction between the two. Um, the other thing that happens with legacy is actually within your company, within your organization, is that that original thought, why you wrote that code in the first place, won't be the same in about five years' time. There's this whole lot to talk about businesses pivoting, changing tax. So I, I say I work for Encore, and um, last week somebody was telling me about uh, what Encore was originally. It was all about um, trying to basically do sort of matchmaking between sort of tech needs and tech skills and bring it together. And now what we're about is about data analytics and making better decisions and things like that. So it's, it's completely different, but that's where the code base started off. And, um, and basically, in the meantime, we, you, know, you have to earn your crust. So you can't just say, OK, I'll just go throw that out of the window and rewrite everything. It's, it's sort of stage by stage, deadline by deadline. Uh, we keep going. So business pivots are another reason why you might have legacy code. It was a good idea at the time. It's just that's not the, the answer you're looking for because it's not the, the problem you're looking at now. I think the other thing, before we get too snooty about all those systems of the past, is also that legacy might not be that old. So I don't know what's going on at the moment in terms of microframeworks and PHP, but you hear rumblings about Lumen. Um, you hear rumblings about uh, Silex the, the Symfony frame, uh, micro framework, whether or not Symfony 4 will actually mean that we don't actually need separately Silex. Um, I don't know, there's kind of rumblings you have. Um, and if you're living in the JavaScript world, then probably, yeah, I mean, the time between you started this talk and the time I end it, then all your code is legacy. It's just, it's like nonstop. So it's not just those old things that we have to think about. And, Clearly, um, we are currently writing the legacy that we're going to have to put up with. So that old phrase of saying that um, you know, write your code as if you're going to be facing a psychopath and answering for it in six months' time. Usually, I'm writing the code because I'm the psychopath that I'm having to face in six months' time, and thinking, <laughs> what the hell was I thinking at that stage? Um, but equally, I mean, we've sat and listened to Chris talk about chart about graphs, and 
you might all be now thinking, oh my God, why the hell did I write my tree in that way in my database? I've got to go off and rewrite it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're here and we're learning and we're getting new things, we're understanding, and we've got to try and work out what to do with, uh, with our code. So, so one of the things um, which part of this is coming back to Lucia's talk from last time, is actually preparing for that change. Um, because, because change is basically is risk. Um, so you need buy-in, you need buy-in from management. And there's no point in going back and saying, oh, I read this great thing about, um, about graphs. We really all need to be doing that now. It's really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and saying that to your boss or saying that to a client, whoever's paying your, your wages at the end of the day, they need something to be able to understand why you're wanting to change things. Why you're basically you're, you've got this uh, system that you're, you've relied on in the past, this way of working you've relied on in the past. Why am I actually bothering to change that? Because I'm going to be introducing risk. Um, so you need to start thinking about things in their terms. So, um, for example, if, you're, if we're uh, thinking about putting in unit testing, again, something that isn't traditionally happening in the, sort of the Drupal and WordPress world, if you start putting in um, unit testing, then that's one thing to say to them. The other thing is to say, okay, I'm going to give you confidence. Each time that we put out, we deploy code, we can make sure that it's not going to uh, fall apart as much as, as it has done in the past. Um, it could be that um, you're looking at things like um, if we're wanting to attract good people, then we need to be bring them in challenges that we need to be saying, uh, rather than saying, come along to us and work with Drupal 6, we need to be saying, come along to us and work with Drupal 8, work with Symfony components, work with these new things, make it exciting, get in some good talent. Um, so actually being able to identify that as a, as a business benefit is, is a key thing to do. Um, I would say, making changes is, is harder for an agency because in the end, quite often the client doesn't care about you know, the fact that, say for example, if you're trying to think about moving up from PHP 5 into PHP 7, what's the benefit for them, really? It's just, you know, they're wanting their new widget to go on their home page. That's what they want. They don't want to care about things. They, they cut and say um, that moving from PHP 5 to PHP 7 gives you a speed bonus without having to do anything in terms of re rewriting your code. Um, again, that's, that's not going to be enough of a sell for them because that, that widget is the thing that they're, they're promoting their new, their new service, their new product. That's what they want to get out the door and everything else the same. So it is harder and I think it takes slightly longer. You have to be, either you have to do it sort of under the covers so they don't actually realise that's what you're doing in the end. Um, other times you need to be able to just say, here's my, my central core code I'm, I'm building, I'm reusing with my clients A I've got here. I'm going to, when I come to client B next time, I'm going to have done something slightly better and moved it on and make sure that I can actually just put it back into to client B. And it might be that you could also think about things like um, having a retainer rather than just a one-off project contract, is trying to build up some sort of support contract, retainer contract, where this is kind of something incremental that they get all the time. Um, and I was saying at the beginning as well, in terms of celebrating some of the good things about our legacy software, um, is also making sure you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, because, um, again, for all its faults that we, when we look at the code in, underneath WordPress, lots of people like writing in WordPress. It's a far, far easier thing to write. Um, I remember taking a, a designer through the Drupal admin pages after having previously done WordPress, and they were lost because it, was just, it, just, it wasn't um, comparable at all. And the, um, kind of trying to keep it internal to make sure, okay, so I'm going to write my own, my own admin system because it's going to be great, brilliant. I'm going to make sure my code is really perfect. It's, it's going to be stunning. Again, there's 
not anybody really who's got the, the same resources available to them as Automatic have in terms of pushing that admin interface forwards. So it's not just <coughs> about throwing out everything. Um, it's about thinking, thinking what we can keep. Um, another really important thing as well is you've got to bring the rest of your team along with you. Um, part of that is just sanity. You need a holiday. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you're writing, whatever you're changing, that they're still good, that somebody else is going to be able to pick up the slack from, and take it over from you. Um, but also with um, a number of these changes, you've, you don't want to be in a position of fighting. So if you've, um, for example, if you take uh, Dave's talk about using content types, if that's what you're saying, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to work, this is really great, it works in a great way. Again, it's business benefit, as uh, Dave was saying in his talk, it's, it's bringing the cost, reducing the cost, bringing the time that you, you spot problems uh, a lot earlier. Yes, that's great. But if nobody else understands it, nobody else knows how to do it, um, then that becomes really problematic. So you've got to also think about things like training, about documenting, about trying to instill good practices with other people. Um, I think in that context of trying to look at your team, um, I came across this a couple of years ago uh, as a graph of looking at um, how people are motivated and how they, uh, how they adopt uh, technology. And at the time, actually, I was, I was, in fact, I was banging my head against a brick wall with a team I was working with as a contractor on a Drupal 7 project um, and trying to introduce them to new ideas, bring new things in. And I sort of suddenly realized that actually what I was really dealing with was I was dealing with a lot of people here in the late majority. So the idea about this is that um, you've got you know, people who probably come in, they're writing their software, the people who wrote Neo4j, probably sitting around somewhere around here, they're getting their head on with things, thinking, I've got this problem, I've got this really great idea, I'll get on and do it. Um, you've then got the people who say, actually, yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea, I'll, I'll start trying to bring it in. Um, here, by the early majority, you've probably got, you know, you've got a number of talks at PHP conferences, um, and it's probably now, um, that say something like Neo4j might be being talked about uh, in the sense that you know, it's, it's, it's kind of new, but not everybody's using it. Whereas um, you know, something like MySQL and thing would be somewhere back here. You know, it's, it's basically, when you come into this stage with the late majority, it's all bundled. I use MySQL because it's installed with Drupal. I use it because it's installed with this. And laggards, you know, it's just kicking and screaming there. They're, trying, they're on the punch cards, and they just don't want to move away. Um, and so trying to sort of look at your team and try and work out where people are um, is, is quite important. And, um, and that's probably also where you get times in the past as well. We've had the, the difference between devs and ops, because for one, for like it or not, you probably want your ops team to be slightly further back here. You don't want them to be sort of saying, you know, um, maybe a couple of years ago, oh, there's this new thing on Amazon, it's called Lambda, let's, let's just change everything over to Lambda. And just, you know, we've got a multi-million pound business, let's just, let's just give it a whirl, you know, it's, who cares, let's just see what happens. Um, so your ops team's probably going to be slightly more towards this, they're going to be very cautious, you know, they're probably wanting you to stick with PHP 5 at the moment, and certainly I've had, <laughs> I've instances where they're probably on PHP 5.3, and they're slightly further back here, and trying to push them ahead is really difficult. But just, I found that a really useful thing to, to be able to try and understand who I was working with and, and to, to empathize with them, and also just think about how can I help them to move on. Um, and I think it's also important to also think about you know, when, when to give up, really. Um, because going back to the, that whole issue about sort of trying to present the business case, um, and not too long ago, I was sitting down talking with uh, a CTO and saying, look, you know, you've got me here now, I'm on contract, I'm working with you, I'm doing this, um, and it's on this particular technology stack that you're using. If you ask me back you know, this month, 
if I, you know, if I was new, fresh, I wouldn't come and work here because it's old, you know, because it's an old version of PHP, because it's an old version of this, because it's an old version of that. Um, as a contractor, that's, that's not helpful for my CV at all. Um, and I think that's, that's true for the rest of us, you know, if, whether you're working full time or contract, whatever it is, then if you're stuck in the past, it's, um, then it's, it's just, it's not helping your career. It's not, it's not giving you that buzz. And that's time to walk away. And that's also something that the business has to think about because um, as I say, I, I do know a company around who is still using Drupal 6. So that's something that came out in 2008. We're nearly 10 years back on that. What sort of staff are they looking to, to recruit and to, to bring in? It's somebody who's comfortable there and not even looking forward. You know, look, not really looking at you know, object-oriented programming, probably. You know, it's, it's, that's kind of a bit too out there. Um, and as a business, that's, that's just not a good place to be. So I think if, if you can't convince your business then, and you realize it's not your fault, then yeah, give up. Um, making a change. I suppose this is probably where part of the talk started off with a lot of the times I see people just wanting to just want the slate clean, because that's the easiest thing. Let's just get rid of everything because it's all rubbish, it's all hopeless. Um, I would encourage you, if, I don't know whether everybody saw, I think a couple of years back, there was a Bloomberg article called What is Code, where it was trying to explain the whole process of, um, of what was involved with writing code from a, a manager's point of view. Um, and it's, I, I really recommend reading that because it's great because it just gives you a completely different perspective because it's somebody sitting there thinking about um, these big barrels of dollars being burnt because that's, that's how I think they realised that I think $100,000 fits into a barrel. So that was their Oracle um, fee for a year, just burning away. And somebody comes in and says, actually, Oracle's not really that great anymore. We need to be doing something else. And, and they was trying to work out, you know, is this a five-barrel problem? Is it a ten-barrel how many barrels are we burning here? Um, I, I do find that problem of saying, I'm just going to get rid of absolutely everything and start again. Um, I think one of them is that you start writing code, but it, it doesn't see the light. It might not see the light of day for six months. It might, might not see the light of day for 12 months, two years. All that time, that code is sitting there. Somebody's paying for that. And it's actually not doing the business any good at all. Um, so getting that code out and getting somebody to use it is going to be beneficial because if we go back to the, the benefits of the business, if that means that you've got far more stable deployments, then it's better to start doing that incrementally now and having that benefit right now rather than waiting six months, 12 months, two years. Um, there's also just sort of, yeah, changing everything. I've, I've been through um, changes both of um, code bases and concepts, and everything changes full scale. Um, and it's just, it just is so risky. So um, the fact that even if you've adopted uh, agile methodology, which quite often with these sort of revolutionary changes means that you've still got kind of a waterfall approach in that in a year's time, I've got to get all these requirements out the door because that's what was said. It's just I'm just having to chop it up into two week intervals and somebody else has a good chance to just throw in some more requirements, which I have to do as well as the other things that were said at the beginning. Um, so you do that, you show things and everybody's really happy and it's great and great. But as you come closer and closer to that, um, that big day that's going to be so everybody is going to celebrate, and that's really, unfortunately, that's, that's a, an easy thing for the business to understand. You know, we've got rid of the old thing. Today, it's, it's ground zero of starting afresh. Um, that what you find is people take their eye, their eye off the ball in terms of what you're presenting to them, because suddenly, say, if you're working on a content website and you're changing absolutely everything at the same time, then in the last couple of months, then suddenly they're sitting down and thinking, okay, so I've got to rewrite, I've got to rewrite this section, I've got to think about how I'm going to categorize this, I've got to think about this, I've got to think about that. All their time is spent on that and not actually seeing on the final result that's coming out at all the review sessions. 
and then you release it and then everybody says, oh, is that how it works then? Okay, I didn't really realize that. So taking the evolutionary approach just means that you can say, okay, we're not going to do our blog layout like this and we're not going to do it like this anymore. It's going to change and we're going to do it like this and we're going to do it like this in a month's time. And it's just, there's a slight adjustment there. And it's not, it's not easy to all go out and celebrate that slight adjustment, but it's, it makes it better. So I, do, I would say sort of go for an evolutionary approach and start small. So um, again, thinking about, say something like a, uh, you know, if you think about a multi-million pound business, to think, okay, so I'm going to write this really great code. It's going to be unit tested. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to be everything. And you just pick that core part of your, of your code base um, to just to try out. Then you're elevating the risks again. Because if it doesn't work and you've got a deadline and something's gone wrong, it's really difficult. You need to pick something small um, and say, okay, so I'm just going to show you um, how this, would, this small section would work. And we're just going to do this. If it doesn't quite work right, then that's okay because everything doesn't founder. Um, but it, it gives us a chance to do it under less pressure. Um, again, from these things, you know, have a clear goal about what is it that you're trying to achieve, what's the benefits going to be, um, and don't just think. Hopefully, you've got nothing to be failing, but equally, you're unlikely to be able to be absolutely successful because you're going to be introducing new ideas. You've got to, even if you understand all the concepts, you've got to make sure that the rest of the team does and make sure that, that everything's in place. Um, so, so give, you a chance, give yourself a chance to actually improve the next time. Um, and then once you've kind of got confidence, once you've got proof concepts in there, then it's starting to think about kind of really hitting the cool thing. Because um, as I say, if you're making that evolutionary approach, then you want that core part of your business to be, whether it's you know, faster because it's on a, you've upgraded everything to PHP 7, whether it's you know, got your unit testing in, whether it's um, putting in your, um, your content type so that actually there, the heart of your system, you're actually reducing the, the time you're rewriting or creating bugs. Um, problem with it, it's not efficient because you can't do everything in one fell swoop. So you've got to say, you've got to compromise basically at some stage and then you have to come back and rewrite a chunk of code again and come back and rewrite it again and move it on and move it on at times. Um, one of the complications is probably using outdated software. Um, it's, you're starting off with a problem anyway because it's insecure. Uh, so that's not a good start. But um, having dependencies of, um, of your versions can make it different, difficult to take a step up. So it might be that you say, okay, for this sprint, or this next couple of sprints, we're gonna just upgrade things as much as we can. We're not actually gonna introduce any new functionality, we're just gonna try and push up on our code base that we've got we've brought in. Um, again, dealing with, um, thinking about people who've worked in things like WordPress and Drupal in the past. Um, you've got a tight deadline, people fall back on their old instincts. Um, and it's, that's, that's kind of a difficulty that you try and, you've got to try and avoid or try and work through. Um, and I would say there's also a problem of, um, of that sort of continual improvement because we've, hopefully we're starting to get past that now. But I think as we know, there's, there's a period when PHP just stalled and we were on sort of PHP 5, 5.2, and it wasn't really that much being added in. Suddenly, something like Drupal just sat there on Drupal 7 for, what was it, five or six years? Five years. Um, so people coming into development, PHP development at that time, that was what the, the norm was. Um, I had a lead developer saying, OK, I know all about <coughs> PHP. Um, but then later on, finding out really when they started coding other things, they were coding uh, object-oriented PHP in PHP 4 format. Um, but as far as they're concerned, they, they knew everything. Um, and that's, so hopefully, 
a large number of systems when you think about things. Obviously, PHP is shifting on rapidly. Drupal is shifting on. WordPress has always had this sort of um, quite aggressive cycle of three months, four months uh, updates. Um, and you think in sort of JavaScript land, things like Angular, again, had a similar thing. Jump from Angular 1 to Angular 2 was hard. And now they're just going, OK, we're just going to do six month cycles. And the numbers aren't really that important. We're just going to keep uh, trying to make slight incremental changes. Um, another problem I've come across quite a lot is um, with, with platforms, really, is that dependency on what somebody else is providing. Um, so having discussions about changing from um, sort of more procedural Drupal 7 approach into starting to use object-oriented and new components and packages, and isn't that wonderful and lovely? Then rather than um, the thing I was battling there was rather than people saying, I've got a Drupal user object which I'm passing around, they were then scurrying off and saying, OK, so what can I use? OK, oh, Symfony is good. Symfony is part of Drupal 8. I'll then make everything based on the, the Symfony user instead. Um, and the problem with that is you're just, again, you're starting to build in that legacy that Symfony might go off into a different direction than your particular approach is. Um, it is difficult to, to break through that mindset. Um, it's probably the same thing there. I don't, can't remember where I put that one in. Um, one thing as well is um, when you're instituting this change, again, trying to be nice to your team, trying to focus on what's important in terms of your reviews. Um, there are some things which I would kind of let go. So things like, um, if you like trying to change over to a PSR2 code styling. For an initial review, I'd probably let that go. Um, it's, it's, it's not great. It's something I can live with, though, because if somebody's written uh, their code and it's in a good shape, maybe they've written tests, then really what I want to do is I want to get that code out the door onto our site in production and be able to make use of that because there's some functionality there that they've been working on. The fact that you can then say to them, OK, so we've done this. Code styling is a bit, is not quite what we want. So we're going to mark that as something that to come back to as another, as another cycle of development. Just get that bit sorted out and then bring it in separately. Whereas um, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of keen on doing are things like having uh, private properties in classes and have uh, getter and setter methods. Um, that one I would probably push more because what I know there is if I, if I make it private and I've got my getter and setter methods, then the class that I'm looking at is the thing that actually is interacting with those properties. That if somebody else wants to inherit this and use it, they can't sort of, from the outside, just come in and pluck out or insert um, a value into a property without what somebody originally wrote um, actually saying, this is, this is the way to use this. Um, and I know that something like that is, when you're introducing people to more of an OO type uh, concept, it's something that they can sort of struggle with is that they're so used to, say, for example, with Drupal, where you've got your various hooks um, and you could have a hook for rendering the whole of the HTML page. You've got to pre-process HTML. From there, you could just sort of say, OK, because it's, because it's an article, I'll do this. Because it's a blog, I'll do this and have that logic sitting out somewhere completely separate from some class which says, I'm an article, I have these properties, I have these methods, this is what's going on, and try and go down that sort of the, the S of the solid approach. Um, so you know that, as I say, you're, you're going to be introducing a lot of change, um, and you need to give people some feedback to try and help them through. Um, so just pick your battles where actually it really will make a difference. Um, probably the last one is, as I was saying at the beginning, it's, um, we are writing our own legacy code right now. So we need to know that we've got to keep on moving forward.
Oh, thank you. Uh, any questions? I was going to say, do we also need to organise sort of like a, a group of legacy people to have a group hug <laughs> sometime later? <laughs> Sorry. So I'm completely on board with the evolutionary rather than revolutionary with this. Yep. When I've done revolutionary stuff, I just introduced a whole load of new bugs. But how do you do evolutionary stuff? I mean, your, your Drupal 6, you can't, there's no, I, I don't know much about Drupal, but there's no clean path to Drupal 6, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, it's, it's not like, even simply, I mean, they've improved it now from 2, 3 onwards, but, but what do you do when you have to like, throw out a whole thing like Drupal 6? To... Um, yeah, I mean, the, the actual Drupal side of it, yes, that's, that is a problem. Um, and in, it might be as well that you have to do that Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 to Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 rather than just do the straight loop up to Drupal 8. Um, that probably goes back to, it does go probably to the, my idea of trying to insulate what you're doing. So um, it's not just something I've seen within Drupal but um, within sort of things like Angular as well where um, people quite often put a lot of the functionality within that Angular code or within the Drupal code. So I was saying about uh, hooks that you have in Drupal, um, that the response is, oh yes, I'm just, I've got to do change, make this change, I've got to build a new model, module. Um, it's completely separate to all my other modules. I'm going to write all these hooks, which are completely separate to all my other hooks. Um, there, in terms of insulating it and making it your own code, is to say, if I'm going to write my, my class completely separately, and do it in my nice PSR4 namespace, everything wonderful and lovely, and just make calls into that. So you just minimize what is Drupal and just take away what is your business logic, what's, what do you need to preserve? Um, and that's probably one of the things I'd say is in terms of where I am, one of the things we are doing at the moment, we are using Drupal 7, but I probably don't use that that much from a certainly from day to day, um, it's not that often I'm thinking, because we've, we've kind of stepped one, to one side and said, this is, our, this is actually our, uh, our business logic, this is our code. Um, and that's probably also where, in a review, I would say, um, if somebody's putting into outside, into sort of the PSR4 namespace, if they're starting to put in Drupal functions in there, that's one of the things I'd probably mark and say, Okay, we'll get that does the job right now, but that's something we're going to come back to, and we're going to take that out and put that somewhere else. Um, so, so that's anyway. And similarly with the JavaScript, you know, getting things out into plain old JavaScript objects um, rather than um, having everything in there. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. I don't have my LinkedIn thing, so I don't know whether. Well, Sorry, we'll, we'll put you that put that up. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I can do that. Yeah.